Hello and welcome to Face to Face. My name is Godfrey Akuto Boafo. On today's episode of Face to Face, as we continue our march through Heritage Month on City TV and on City FM, we explore Ghanaian music, its history, its practitioners, and where it is going. And who better to have a conversation with than an ethnomusicologist who is also an architecture buff, apparently. He's a lecturer, he's a historian, and has written a bestseller that is the seminal book on Ghanaian music history. Professor John Collins is our guest today on Face to Face. Professor Collins, welcome to Face to Face. Welcome. Thank you very much. So my first question would be, what is a boy born in Britain of Irish descent yeah. doing in Ghana as a Ghanaian? I can only blame my father because he brought me here when I was a child mm. uh, because my dad helped set up the philosophy department at Lagon. 1952, just be even before independence. Mm. Um, and then much later, I came back as a, a young man uh, to do a, a degree in sociology and archaeology at Lagon because my dad was still here. Mm. So I wanted to reconnect with my father. I hadn't seen him for a long time. Um, and I was also by then uh, a guitarist. I'd been a guitarist in some jazz and rock bands mm. in England. So I came with my guitar. And when I landed in Ghana, I went. My father had married um, an Achim lady called Auntie Amma, my Auntie Amma, in Ab uh, Adwajiri, mm -hmm. and built her a house, in fact. So I went to meet my stepmother with my guitar, because I always carried my guitar in those days. <laughs> and the leader of the Jaguar Jokers was her tenant. That's oh. Opia. And it, we, he took me on trek immediately. I'd hardly been in Ghana more than about a week, and I was on trek with the Jaguar Jokers guitar band as a guitarist playing in different villages. So that's how I got into This is even before I started at Lego. And it's interesting, you talk about coming in as the son of a philosophy lecturer, yeah, yeah. studied architecture, uh, archaeology, well, archaeology, and yeah, sociology, yeah, yeah, yeah. with a passion for music. Yes. And yet you taught chemistry and physics? Yeah, I did a science degree in England as well. I, I switched actually, originally my interest was in science as a child, mm -hmm. and then I switched to social sciences when mm -hmm. I came to Ghana, and then music was like a hobby that took over. So uh, that's why I have a fa fa fairly wide education. Um, most people don't switch from the science to the arts so much. Okay. In my case, I did. And you decided to write this very big book, and for those of you who are watching, High Lifetime 3, and I've tried to read it. It's taking me a while, but I'm, I'm trying. 600 pages. 600 <laughs> pages. That's a lot of history yeah. of yeah. Ghanaian music. What was the motivation? Well, the thing is that this is this is a, this called High Lifetime 3, because yes. it's a third edition. Mm. And it, it w I originally wrote the first edition in 94, 1994, then 1996. And it was published by uh, Charles Wiruku Brobby who mm. was running Anansi Press. Tarzan. Tarzan, he's my best friend, you know. Ah, he's yeah. a publisher as well. Yes, he had, <laughs> a, a, he had a publishing house called Anansi Press. Okay. And he was also running tourist magazines, and that's how I got to know him. I was writing mm. some columns in his paper, because I was also a journalist, by the way, at that yeah. time. So he realized that I was sitting on a lot of information, which I'd gleaned from working with musicians and working in Nigeria as well, not only Ghana and, and Liberia. So. He, and I'd worked with some of the, uh, let's say, the godfathers or the grandfathers of, of Ga Ghanaian high life music, mm. like Kwame Asari, I, I mean his nephew, Kwame Mensa, Iti Mensa, and so on. And I'd taken biographies. But you see, I didn't come to Ghana to write the history of high life. I came to do a study sociology and archaeology, be with my dad, mm. and then I started playing in bands like the Jaguar Jokers, Happy Stars, and different, different bands. Um, so, but through doing this, I noticed there wasn't much written on, on high life music or a African popular music. Mm -hmm. So I kept notes, made interviews. And so after about 20 years of this, I was sitting on a lot of information. So Robbie recognized that in me. And we did the first edition, mm -hmm. but, the, but then it, of course it was completely out of date by now. So he asked me to do the third edition with, with uh, um, his, I, would, I don't know, I would call it his next generation, you know, Kofi and uh, Nana, mm -hmm. uh, Damwa. These guys have set up their own publishing house, which works alongside with the older Nancy Sempress, but that's now, I think, defunct. Yeah. So they've taken over the mantle. 
So they asked me to, uh, uh, to rewrite the book, and after 20 odd years since the first one, if, you saw, if I had my first book, I will show it to you, it's, it's, it's only 200 pages. <laughs> but this one, obviously time has passed, uh, and there's more. A lot more information. Uh, more, yeah, yeah, this that's is, why. This is music history on steroids. But <laughs> I, I was fascinated by going, reading your book, The History of Gold Coast music, of Ghanaian, what became yeah. Ghanaian high life music. Yeah. Can you take us through a bit of the origin? Because it's so diverse. Yes, that's the first thing, that there's no single origin of high life. Um, it's not, uh, the only thing you could say that's common to all high life is there's an input from southern Ghanaians, mm -hmm. particularly the Fantis and to, to quite a, a large extent Gars. So it's not a product of one ethnic group. But the, uh, if you look at, back to the history, there are three completely different origins of high life, even before the word, see the word wasn't even, in, even invented until the 1920s. Mm, the but, word high life? Yeah, it was, um, I've, I've got this from E.T. Mensah's older brother, Yebwa Mensah, who was running the Accra Rhythmic Orchestra in the 1930s. So he, he gave me the story of how the word was invented. Okay. But the thing is that even before the word was there, what we would now call high life was already around and there were two types. There was the brass bands in the Fanti area. Mm -hmm. um, they, they were called Adaha bands. Uh, and uh, that was sort of an influence of traditional, uh, maybe Fanti music, plus Western instruments, of course, like brass bands coming in from the army. And then also the present, presence of uh, about thousands of West Indian soldiers at Cape Coast and Elmina. You know, a lot of people don't know this, that we talk about Bob Marley, we talk about dance hall and the Jamaican influence on Ghana, right? Yeah. But most of these soldiers came either from Trinidad or Jamaica, and they were brought to, to Ghana or the Gold Coast by the British because they were in the British army fighting their mm. shanties. And when they sent the whites, the white soldiers to Kamasi, most of them got sick from malaria because this country used to be called the white man's grave. But they noticed that uh, people of African descent from the Caribbean uh, didn't die of, or get sick from malaria, so they had tropicalized soldiers. And so altogether about six or seven thousand West Indian soldiers were stationed at Elmina and Cape Coast. And the negative side is they helped the British defeat the Ashantis, but the positive side is they brought in Afro-Caribbean music. Mm. And so this combination of uh, Ghanaian musicians who've been trained by the British to play brass band music in British style were also uh, listening to uh, brass bands played by these, the West Indian soldiers, and they were using syncopated rhythms, syncopated marching, um, African features. So there was a sort of coales co uh, what, coales coalescence of all this around about 1880, and we get the emergence of uh, the first Adaha bands. And in fact, in the early days, they actually copied the West Indians. You know, you know the song, Everybody Likes Saturday Night, yes. or All For You. Yes. We take them in Ghana as standard highlights, or old time highlights, but in fact there were West Indian melodies. Wow. But, so the Ghanaians copied them for a while, but then, like any person, you get bored for, with copying somebody. And so within a few years of the West Indians coming to Ghana, mm -hmm. the Ghanaians had sort of hijacked the idiom, Ghanaianized it, added, added Ghanaian rhythms, and turned it into Adaha music. Okay. So that's one type of, uh, origin of high life, okay. Adaha music. W what, you know. what was the, you talk about something called Osibasa. Uh, Osibi, Osibi and Os o o Osibi Saba. Oh yeah, yes. Uh, yes. What that, was that? That was a different style of early high life, which didn't come from the impact of, say, of, of um, soldiers, black mm. soldiers from the Caribbean and Ghanaian soldiers mixing up, but rather black sailors who were coming to the ports and the the most important were the Liberian crew people who were employed on sailing ships and steamships mm. by the British and the Americans from the 18th century. So these people weren't slaves or anything like that. They were just simply black sailors, African sailors. Mm. And they picked up African, in, uh, the sailor's instruments like, if you're on board a ship, you won't be carrying heavy duty instruments. You'll be carrying guitar, banjo, maybe flute, Kalele. concertina, yes, concertina, you know, um, maybe harmonica. So what they did is they picked up sailors' instruments on the high seas and then they Africanized the guitar in particular. Mm. And if you go back to the origins of palm wine music in Sierra Leone, Ghana, 
or Nigeria, you'll find that they always mention the influence of these crew people because they developed a spe specific Af West African way of playing the guitar, which wasn't based on Western principles, mm. but was based on the same principles you can see today if you see King Ayasoba and the others playing the koligo. Mm -hmm. Africans play the, the stringed instruments by this type of movement. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a lefty, so I'm yes. plucking like this. And you're using your thumb and the first finger. Yeah. That's if you don't use a plectrum. Yeah. So if you don't use a pick, that's how it's done. But the Western way is to use all the fingers, fingers. the classical style. So this two-finger technique was spread down the West African coast by the crew people. And in Ghana, it took root around about 1900 by the fan, you know, fancy fishermen, because mm. these crew people would sometimes stay around. I think some even settled in Ghana. Okay. And the Ghanaians picked up this style of music. It's known as mainline or dagomba. And it's called uh, Dagumba. Yeah, after a name of a ship. It's a name. It has of nothing a, to do with North Ghana. No, no, nothing. It's it was it was the name of it was a song, popular Liberian song called something like, uh, I think Dagomba Waya Tengabu. Okay. It, it, I think it was the name of a ship called the Dagomba ship. Okay. Um, anyway, these styles sort of percolated into the coast, and the Ghanaian guitarists also play it. And if you talk to Koenimo or anybody like this who can still play the old palm wine music, they will talk about these Liberian styles. But then the Ghanaians quickly developed their own style like Yam Ponsa, Adonson, and so on. Okay. So this led to the Osabisaba Osa style okay. from the Fantis. Okay. So that's the two origins of High Life. Then some of this music, the Adaha, the Osabisaba, was orchestrated by the elite uh, the uh, dance ballroom dance orchestras mm -hmm. around about 1920s we had so many Ghanaian not w white but Ghanaian ballroom dance orchestras playing foxtrots and waltzes and some of them uh, and this was to serve the colonial yeah, occupants not really no it was there wasn't even a white audience it was actually for for the elite Ghanaians oh. yeah I mean sometimes they would mix up at Cape Coast Castle or something but it was really quite an independent form of music but at first it was very much under, under the colonial mentality because they only played imported music but then some of them started to play the local proto the like the Adaha tunes the Usubisaba tunes and then what Yebua Mensa told me that's uh, Iti Mensa's older brother is that the poor people in Accra or Winneba or Cape Coast couldn't get into these dances you had to wear top hat ties and very expensive so they used to have free parties outside on the pavements ah. with their girlfriends or wives and so on. And then suddenly low, they were dancing waltzes and folk, foxtrots and polkas. And then suddenly they heard their own songs, their own music, their own melodies being orchestrated. So they called it high class life music. So high life music. And, but it wasn't that the high class people invented high life. Okay. It was just the name was invented in that okay. context because the high life goes back at least okay. 30, 40 years before the 1920s. Now, in going through your book, High Life Times 3, the name Kwa Mensa is treated with a lot of reverence. Who was he? Why is he so important for you in this well, book? Personally, it was because, well, he used to stay at this house. When, yeah. When, yes, yes. I mean, when I, I lived in Temple House in Jamestown mm -hmm. when I was running a band in the 70s. And that's when he used to stay with me there. But when I relocated to my father's house, and he started to teach a little bit at Legon. He would come and stay with me. And he was the one who actually taught me to play palm wine music. Mm. So people sometimes ask, how did I get to know this music? Partly just watching people, but he actually sat down and taught me because uh, we became very good friends. And, how um, good was he at this? Well, he was the nephew of Kwame Asari. And Kwame Asari is the guy who first recorded Yam Ponsa in 1927. And if you talk about the godfather of Ghanaian palm wine music, the word Jacob Sam or Kwame Asari, it's the same person, mm -hmm. usually appears. Um, and Kwame so when he was his nephew. So when he was a little boy, he used to sit on his uncle's neck. And while the, the, the uncle is going around playing his palm wine guitar music, the boy, that's Kwame Mensa, would be playing the clips oh. or the clavies. So, so he's sort of like a direct continu continuation of his uncle's style. In fact, he told me, taught me some of the Yam Ponsa style of his uncle and the Adonson style that his uncle played. Because um, unfortunately, Kwame Asari or Jacob Sam was never interviewed. 
I mean, he died in about 1950, so people don't know much about him, but quite, he released a lot of records, including about 20 songs he recorded in London in 1927 mm -hmm. or 28. But Kwame is his nephew. And then Kwame himself later on formed a concert party, because mm. a lot of the palm wine guitarists ended up with concert parties, like Ike Nyami. You think of African Brothers, City Boys, pra practically all of the guitar bands in Ghana used to operate with concert parties. So um, then Kwame Mensa was running a concert party and he, he used to dress up as a woman sometimes and things <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he, he was a, uh, but um, I, he's just a, per he was a personal friend. But okay. luckily, he was also this person who held the history and told me a lot. I, okay. You see, his ge uh, Kwame Mensa's generation is older than Konimo's generation. Oh. So today, one of the few people in Ghana you can go to for the history of palm wine music is Konimo. But I was lucky to meet the people before Konimo. Okay. And of course I met Konimo as okay. well. Yeah. You, you spoke about the song Yamponsa. Yeah. And again, it seems to be the base for everything that is perhaps more than high life. A lot of it, yes, uh, yes. What is it? Was it one song? Is it a set of notes? What is Yam Ponsa? Yes, it, it, it was an actual song called Yam Ponsa about a woman called Yam Ponsa who doesn't... And, uh, and the song is like a man is singing to her uh, that sh we shouldn't bother to get married. Let's remain as lovers. Um, and in fact, there's some portions of the, um, so the original song that are a little bit rude. So the, <laughs> the schools and so on, they didn't want this song played. It's the, um, there was a mention to the uh, there was a mention of the word bentwa. Ah, you know that if yes. if I marry you, marry you, this is Jan Ponsa talking now in the song. Then my parents would bentwa me yeah, with pepper. Yeah, because an enema. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was, it, it's sort of a bit bawdy the song, um, and that's why Ephraim Amu took that song. He loved the song, the melody, the rhythm, hmm. and he, he gave it new words about. Oh, school is finished, let's go and play. He m m made the, the, the words more innocuous. But the, it's an actual system of chords, changes. And the best way I could explain this uh, would be, you know, for American blues, there's a basic template in the American blues called the 12-bar blues. And it's a sort of rhythmic or sequence of chords in a certain type of time, using a certain type of time signature. Well, Yampon says something like this. It, it's not just a... The, the lyrics of the song, but it has mm. a s sequence of chords and it has a certain type of clav rhythm, or, which is, 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 is the, uh, this one, you cut, 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 which is found in so much high life. Um, so it became a template. And Konimo calls Jan Ponsa, Jan Ponsa Unlimited, because there are thousands of thousands of editions or renditions of Jan Ponsa, but the words have been changed. Okay. But it's not the only template in high life, there are others. Oh. There's the main line, the adonson, no, no the, the, the main, the ones coming from the crew, mm -hmm. which are still used, the dagomba, the fireman, um, and the main line, and there's also the adonson style, which developed in the villages when the guitar from the coast moved up into the villages in Ashanti and Kwau, and it met an instrument known as the seprawa, okay. which is the akan harp lute, and there was an interaction between these two instruments, and it led to a more a can form of high life known as a donson or blues and a, quite a lot of the have you you know Sitchi high life for yes. instance that style is based on the donson principle okay. it doesn't follow western harmonic progressions okay. so is there an original record of the song yampon yes I've, I've even got it, to it i've even got it in my um uh, yes it was it was recorded in 1928 I've got a copy of it somewhere. Um, oh, okay. I should try to get it to your All right. TV station. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you see, what's interesting is that there was a lot of money in the rural areas. You know, today we think about rural areas in Ghana as poverty, mm -hmm. poverty-struck areas. All the money's gone into the cities. But you know, 100 years ago, it wasn't like this. All the money was in the countryside, the cocoa farmers. The cocoa farmers loved this type of early palm wine music, which some people called native, native records. Okay. So a huge recording industry developed in West Africa for basically the music of um, farmers, rural people in Ghana, Nigeria, called native records. And 
that includes palm wine music okay. and they even sometimes call it cocoasi music in Ghana because oh, okay. you listen underneath the cocoa, cocoa tree, tree. Okay. so it, it, it's interesting to and everybody could afford if you were a farmer a wind up gramophone in those days you don't need electricity you wind up the machine and you're good to go yeah so there was quite I, I've got the facts and I think it's in this book yes one, one of the chapters deals with the early African yes. or West African recording yes. industry and I quote some figures yes you are listening to Professor John Collins as we roll through the history of uh, Ghana High Life Music through his book that he has written, High Life Times Three. Like I said, it's a book everybody must get. We will be back with more as we start pursuing people like E.T. Mensa, Kim Bruce, Osibisa. There's more to hear on Face to Face. Every weekday at 8 p.m., City Newsroom brings you analysis of the major news stories of the day. In-depth, comprehensive, and researched, it's one hour of local and international news from 8 to 9 p.m. It's the City Newsroom, weekdays on City TV. Twisted and tangled story of betrayal, greed, vengeance, and love in the award winning Brazil Avenue. Carminia, a woman led by greed, gets rid of her husband, who is Rita's father, and sends Rita away to a filthy landfill. Rita finds love in Batata, but they are soon separated by adoption into different families far away from each other. Many years later, all paths cross again as Rita, now a renowned chef, seeks to pay back her stepmother for taking away her happiness as a child. It's the story of twists, turns, suspense, and thrilling action in Brazil Avenue. Catch the omnibus of Brazil Avenue on Saturdays from 7 to 10 p.m. and Sundays from 10 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. only on City TV. Welcome back to Face to Face with Professor John Collins, ethnomusicologist, history buff, author of best-selling High Life Times 3. Now, Prof. Collins, as we've been celebrating Heritage Month here at City, we've been playing a lot of E.T. Mensa right. and King Bruce. All the songs I've heard of E.T. Mensa, he's singing about women. Yeah. Was that a style? Well, he did a lot of love songs. He did, but he also did other songs. He, um, um, I mean, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Ghana, Ghana Freedom, High Life. Mm. He did quite a lot of political songs as well. Um, but was he popular back then? Oh yes, yeah. He, the, the, they even called him the King of High Life. I think the Arts Council around in sometime in the fifties they came up with that uh, title for him, even though strictly he should be called the King of Dance Band High Life because it's different from the guitar band High Life. Okay. They had their own kings, like Ike Nyame, Kakeku, and Yamwa. But as for the dance band, he was, uh, the reason E.T. was so popular is, one reason is he had a musician in his band called Guy Warren, known as Kofi Ganaba. Who was, oh, okay, yeah, the who, famous drummer. Yeah, and what, what, Kofi, uh, what Guy did was he brought in Afro-Cuban percussion. So, it, you see, at that time, people were still a bit under the, men, uh, the colonial mentality so they didn't want to use indigenous African drums because they look old-fashioned mm. and this is a modern dance band you know it's, it's basically modeled on a jazz group an American jazz group so Guy Warren brought in the Afro-Cuban percussion which is 50% African mm -hmm. and of course once you bring in the Afro-Cuban percussion it doesn't it it'll only be a year or two before you start to bring in the African percussion so that's one one ingredient there was it was very very it had a lot of percussion it had the jazz drums but it also had the uh, afro-cuban percussion and then later on african percussion was added and then uh, he took uh, jazz music 
um, combined it with high life. But it wasn't, it was the c current jazz music of that era, the 1940s and 50s. So it sounded very modern in those days. And also, I'm just giving you some points yeah. about E.T., why he's so critical. And I'm going to tell you one thing that a lot of people don't know. But anyway, he also was the first person to put women on the professional high life stage. Wow. In the mid-50s, he had Julie O'Kine and Agnes Aiti. And uh, at the time when Ghanaians thought any woman who put herself on stage like that was an ashau or prostitute. A loose woman. Yes, but you, these weren't at all. These were singers. Um, and I think, I did, I, you know, I wrote a book about E.T. many, many years ago. Um, and I, I never asked him that question. Why were, was his band bold enough and why were these women bold enough to break that taboo? And I think it was because some of the greatest jazz singers in America at that time were women. You know, um, people like... Um, Oh, I mean, there were so many, uh, just trying to think of some, some of them. Uh, I was going to say Aretha Franklin, but she came... Ella yeah. Fitzgerald, Ella Fitzgerald in particular, Sarah Vaughan. So I think it gave a space. If you're going to, to be influenced by American jazz, and the, ja the American jazzists are having famous black American women singers, why not in Ghana? So I think that's why he did that. But yeah. he was the first to put women on the stage. Um, some of them even recorded... Okay. And then another reason why uh, E.T. was very important was he was really the person who took dance band High Life to, to Nigeria. Um, th there is some evidence that High Life was get going to Nigeria by the 1930s, but it was never a substantial part of their repertoire. But when E.T. came with his modern High Life sound, with a sort of jazzy High Life, mm. he floored the whole place. I mean, everybody, uh, whether it's Victor Olaya or um, Bobby Benson, they all started to play high life, but in their own way, you know, Yoruba or Igbo and so on. So you can see. And then here's the story that most people don't know. Um, E.T. Mensah's band also influenced Sekaturi in Guinea. Mm. He, he went to, he, his band actually played in um, uh, Guinea just after the Guineans had said no to the French and disconnected with them and became fully independent. And you know the French ruined the country before they yeah. left. They destroyed the country. And so when he got to the country, it was completely bro broke. He said everybody was eating bananas. And uh, the, even the immigration people, when they came in as a band, they had no uniforms and no rubber stamps to let them in because the French had destroyed even those things. And then at the same time, that was when Nkrumah went to with cash to help them out. I think you know the story. Yeah. He took a lot of dollars and cash to help the Guineans out of this temporary liquidity crisis problem. But E.T. Mensah's band and Nkrumah were there roughly at the same time. And what I've been told by Guinean and Malian musicians is that they didn't have anything like high life. So they'd just become independent. They had French music, they had traditional mm -hmm. African music, but they didn't have anything in between. And so when Sekaturi saw the, 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 this band get on stage looking like an American jazz band and playing purely Ghanaian or African music, he was so astounded that he gave orders that the government should set up their own dance bands to play their own rhythms. So we, wow. he set up uh, Bembea Jazz, Les Amazons, and all those bands that were set up in that country, I've been told uh, that E.T. Mensah had an influence on this. And wow. you, by the way, E.T. Mensah didn't know about this. I only found out about this when I went to Mali some years ago. Interesting. Yeah. It, it, it's good you mentioned Nkoma because I was going to ask you a question about Nkoma. Music in Ghana seems to thrive, and especially I mean the music of the era, yeah. seems to thrive under him. Why was this so? Well, actually, Nkrumah was pro high life. Mm. You see, when he, he took power, he wanted to use all forms of Ghanaian music to boost national identity. So, for instance, he had traditional music. So he set up the Institute of African Studies, the School of Performing Arts, where you, where you went. <laughs> so that it all goes back to Nkrumah. But that was for more the traditional side. Yeah. And then, of course, he encouraged art music because he needed patriotic songs, national anthems, wow. Philip Beho, you know, Ghana's national anthem. So this, but he also liked high life. And there was a, he liked high life as he, because he was a Ghanaian, but there was a political reason he liked high life. You see, high life isn't tribal music. It involves uh, the, the Akans, the Gars, and to a smaller extent, the Eves. So he already had in the system a national music. So you can use High Life to project national identity 
and not tribal identity. Mm. And so he, he, uh, this is the problem that uh, Secretary had. He didn't have any, he had tribal music, what you could call yeah. tribal music, and he had the French music, which he didn't want. He wanted, but wh what about the indigenous popular music? And it couldn't be purely tribal, because you might want to project not a tribe, but the whole nation. Mm. So Ghana had high life. And that's why the, the Nigerians picked up High Life too from the Ghanaians. They used it as a national. So the, it wasn't just Nkrumah, High Life went to a Nigerian, became a national okay. identity music. But that's why Nkrumah liked High Life and, and concert parties as well. Okay. He, he, I mean, he was very interested in popular music. Okay. Does that account for then the demise of popular music at that time under the military regimes of the time? Because it looks like yeah. Nkrumah paid attention they yeah. set out to kill it. Well, they didn't set out to kill it. It was I inadvertent. I mean, it, people making military coups for one reason or the other, they're not much concerned with the entertainment sector or music. Mm. They're, you know, they're more interested in weapons or s security. So it was a, a casualty of the military era. So I don't think, I mean, even a champong uh, did try to do some positive things in the, in the music industry. And so did Rawlings, you know. He, he was the person who recognized um, the musicians union and things like this but it was inadvertent during military eras anyway uh, in, anywhere in the world you'll find that, that entertainment and music and so on is put on the back burner um, so but but what I would say is that Nkrumah used music including high life as part of national identity and also he brought music deeply into the school system he wanted every child to be able to sing or play an instrument or, so, or an attentiben or something. But that vision disappeared to, to a great extent. For instance, we now have a Ministry of Culture, right? Yeah. You know that this, we didn't have a Ministry of Culture for lit. I mean, I don't know for how many years, 20 years, during the military era, we didn't have any type of mili uh, Ministry of Culture or, the, or it, was, it was sort of attached to something else like education or tourism or mm. chieftaincy or something like this. Um, so, the, the, so I would say that the, I, I don't know why, you, why this happened. I think it's because Nkrumah was using music for national identity, okay. but then the modern leaders couldn't see, because they become, they're no longer socialists, they're more like capitalists, money, you know, money talks type of people. They couldn't see how music could make money either at that time. Okay. It's different now, it's a bit yeah. different now. So they couldn't see the use of music and they even took it out of the education system, as you know, yeah. in 1988. Um, so we have a, a generation of youth now who probably weren't ever taught music. And by the way, they also took history. Oh. And why? this is why I do say this, and I'll say it again, I get very annoyed with older generation people here condemning the youth for not playing their own music and not knowing their history. Who took it out of the education system? The youth didn't. The older generation are, are to blame for this. Okay. So there was something, you were right in a way, but it wasn't that the military did it on purpose. Okay. Yeah, but it was like a blind spot. But there seems to have been a benefit because in those periods we had talent flight to yeah. Europe, the US, and it spawned a golden era of talent. For exactly, Ghana. I mean. Even that, though not yeah, in yeah, Ghana, they were yeah, doing yeah. it elsewhere. Exactly, I mean, it's, it's something like Ghana's lost is, it losses the world's gain. I mean, so many talented musicians like, you know, C.B. and all these guys travel abroad and, and made it. And, and anywhere you go in Europe now, where there's an African contingent in terms of music making, okay. you'll find that the Ghanaians were there and they were probably the earliest. Like, if you go to the USA where they have all these drumming schools, African drumming schools, you know it was mainly set up by Ghanaians, mm. coming from the Arts Council and so on. Or, or if you go into the school systems in England, um, who were the people who set up the drumming school for children? It was Ghanaians. I'm not saying only Ghanaians, but they were very prominent. And as you say, yeah, you're right. I, I, it, it's, it, we lost those people, but then those people are coming back. Mm. So we're also regaining them. You know, I, so it, it's a to and fro. Between us yeah. and them. Okay. Yeah. Now, at that same time, Osibisa, Felakuti had come in. Wulome. Yeah. Where did they imagine all this? Wulome is with a, yeah. music. Yeah, the Wulome, well, funnily enough, at the time that Wulome was coming up, I was running a band in Jamestown mm. called, called uh, Bokor Band. And um, I was I actually recruited people into my band from Agbafoy, 
which is one of the Ga type of cultural groups modeled on Wulome. Wulome were the first. Um, but what they were is Wulome, even though you could say it's a Ga band, there are ingredients in the Wulome which are not Ga. You could say it's a cosmopolitan Ga band yeah. that was reinvented based on Ga traditions, but they, they were using the Atentaben flutes, which come from Ashanti. They were using the Gome drum, that big bass drum, mm -hmm. which ultimately comes from Jamaica, came to Africa from Jamaica 200 years ago. I know it sounds highly peculiar. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks drums only came from Africa to the Jamaica, Caribbean. but there is some e examples of drums coming the other way. And then, of course, the guitarist, the guitarist in, in Wulome was a Fanti guy because yeah. they were playing typical high-life guitar, the palm wine, the crew yeah. style that I was mentioning earlier. So you, you could say that they sort of reworked Ga tradition, they modernized it with non-Ga influences, mm -hmm. but still fundamentally it was a Ga music, Ga la language, Ga proverbs. And I mean, when they started uh, with uh, Niashiti and so on, um, they had to get a permit, by the way, from the Ga Manchi because, mm. you know, they were wearing Wulome, Yes, clothes. So priests and, he, he, and then they weren't allowed to. So he said, oh, as long as you don't wear white, if you wear any other color but white. So that's why they always use yellow. yellow. So they got their blessing from the, uh, the Garmanchi. And, and uh, within a, a twinkle of an eye, in Ga because I, as I said, I was operating in the, in the music scene then, we had about 50 bands playing Wulume type music all around the greater Accra area. Oh, so you have Blimabi, Jajelo. Yeah, exactly, yes, yes, yes. Up. I mean, there were about 50 operating altogether. Wow. So you could almost say that uh, the Wulame was like a cross between ga music and guitar band high life. And then I, later on, much later, I discovered that the gas did have very important guitar band musicians. You always think of Ike Nyami or Kwamensa, mm. you know, Fantis or Akans. But there was a guy called uh, uh, Obiba TK mm. in the 1950s who was a ga. And the gas also had, were playing when I, I've listened to music from the 40s and it sounds like the Wulume style but without the guitars so uh, I don't think the Wulume reinvented everything from nothing but they took pre-existing traditions reformatted them and uh, there's a guy who's written a PhD about the, why was the Wulume so popular in Accra at that precise moment of time nothing to do with music oh. it's to do with identity you see if you think about the 70s a crowd was being swamped by Akans. Yeah. You know, it was originally a Ga city. Yes. And suddenly, and so there was a, ner a nervousness about the identity of the Gars because their, all their neighborhoods had, were becoming Akanized. Um, so there was a resurgence of Ga identity that was manifested through not old music, but a modern form of music. Okay. So this is, I'm quoting from a PhD student. No worries there, Prof. <laughs> uh, there was a, a, a part of the book that I found interesting and I, I was hoping you could elaborate. I was looking forward to asking you about this. The issue of royalties is something that we've discussed yeah. several times in modern yeah. music. And Gamro is always fighting with somebody yeah. for royalties and whatnot. Paul Simon paid $70,000 yes. as copyright fees yes. for using Jan Ponsa. Yeah. Where did that money go? It went to the National Folklore Board. Oh. I was a member of it at the time, okay. between 1991 or 97, for about six years I was. What happened was that Paul Simon is basically an honest man. Even when he went to South Africa, he made sure all the, the musicians he hired the South Af were paid three times the, the, the normal rate. Yeah. And they got very good, uh, what, what do you say, um, he would take them abroad. And, uh, but in Ghana, He's Ghana, one of my favorites, I love his music. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's always been interested in folk music, so he just moved to African folk music, if you can put it that way, mm. with the Graceland's album. Although it wasn't really folk music, it was popular music. Yeah. Um, but then he did the same to Ghana, but he didn't come here. He worked with a, a Nigerian, no, a Cameroonian guy who actually came to this studio once called Vincent Aguni, who had learned to play palm wine music here. Okay. And they also had palm wine music in Cameroon. Right. And then Coffee Electric and some other guys, he put together using the rhythm of Jan Ponsa, but he changed the words. But even that enough was enough to generate, as you said, ultimately it was, it was ori originally about $15,000. And then later on it built up to 70000 So Paul Simon didn't know, know what to do with the money. So he contacted the Ghanaian government and they didn't know what to do with the money because we didn't have a Ministry of Culture or anything to receive the money. Wasn't, weren't there relatives of... Well, you see, and you, see, to take it. you see, this is where a problem occurred. Um, 
In fact, we had a dispute in the in the in the uh, folklore board about this. Um, they declared it was a folkloric work, and the government, as you know, the Ghanaian government has nationalised folklore. It belongs to the government. The whole all the music, all the folklore in Ghana belongs to the government. Um, so they declared it as folklore, and I. I actually and, and Konimo, the musicians on the board, tr disagreed with this. We said that some ac acknowledgement of the family of, of uh, you know, um, Kwame Asari, ha it has to be made. But they, they decided not to. In fact, later on, it led to a split in the folklore board. Wow. Because the lawyer members wanted to apply a tax to Ghanaians for using their own folklore. And myself and Konimo, Professor Anida Hall and some others, uh, Ampe, uh, Nana Ampedu, we all disagreed with this and we lost the case and the, gov the government has uh, now in its new copyright law has a bill or a clause which says that any, not a foreigner like Paul Simon, which is fair enough, Paul Simon should pay money to Ghana for using mm -hmm. a Ghanaian product, but it's p now applied to Ghanaians in the law. It was, uh, when was it, 2005? And uh, I myself and people like Carlos Secchi and Willie Anku Stan Plange, so many of us, we signed a petition, KSM, we all signed a petition that we didn't want it to be applied to Ghanaians mm. because it's, it's, it's self-destructive. Yeah. And, and we actually held up the law for seven years. Kufo, President Kufo refused to sign the L LI, you know, the leg yes. legislative instrument, to go because all these professors and musicians had come and said, no, there's something wrong. So he wouldn't sign it. But when the MPP came back into power, they, signed, they pushed the whole thing through. So it's now part of Ghanaian government law that a Ghanaian citizen, if you use the music or the art or any type of folklore of your grandparents and you commercialize it and you don't pay the government money, you go to prison. Or p that's the but, law. But that's quite different from what we've seen in the West where they've tried to grow their kind of world music in Australia and other places. All countries usually deem folklore um, as belonging to the, all the nationals of that country. Mm. And even Nigeria. Nigeria also nationalized their folklore, just like Ghana has. But the, the Nigerians put in a clause it, saying it does not apply to Nigerian nationals. That's all we needed to have done in Ghana, added that clause. So any young Ghanaian who w will feel free and encouraged to, to develop his own uh, folklore, yeah. why shouldn't you? I mean, folklore is for your uh, the ancestors give you folklore, not just for intellectual reasons, but for physical life, you know, money, they call it money. Yeah. You can make money from folklore. Well, if your grandmother gave you a folk song and you make money, what's, what's wrong with that? But in the new copyright law, it says that it's a crime. But you, you guys will have, to, I, I did my best, Carlos Secchi, all of us, we did our best. So we have to take on the battle. <laughs> well, I think it w the battle will occur when the first case occurs. In a, no case has occurred in any Ghanaian court where a person is being prosecuted for using something coming from his own ethnic group or his own family or his own grandfather or something. You know it. But when it does, then we'll see what happens. But I'm saying in Nigeria, they had more sense. Okay. Yeah. You are watching Face to Face with Professor John Collins, ethnomusicologist, historian, and I hope you're enjoying the conversation as we celebrate our Heritage Month here at City TV and 97.3 City FM. My name is Godfrey Akoto Boafo. We'll be right back. Tune in to The Point of View, Mondays and Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as Bernard Avlet takes the news further. He will bring the right guests, ask them the relevant questions, and get you the real insights you need on the big stories for the day. I predict... Mm that that two billion that GATT is supposed to raise is going to be very challenging. Mm. And I say that very carefully. Think about it. The Point of View with Bernard Avle, Monday and Wednesday nights, only on CTTV.
for all the news, analysis, projections, and policies that affect your business. Curated and delivered in a simple and timely format. Watch Business Dashboard, your most comprehensive source of business news, every weekday at 7 p.m. Only on City TV. Business Dashboard on City TV is sponsored by ADB Bank. Truly a Greek and more. Welcome back to the final headline of my conversation with Professor John Collins. And it's one that I'm enjoying so much, I just don't want it to end. But 600 pages, of course, I have to pick and choose which parts to ask him questions on. Prof, I want to ask about gospel music. Yeah. Because I realized you spoke about gospel music and how it changed two things. One, the commercialization part. And two, again, allowing women yeah. to become more mainstream. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, we've had what you could call danceable Christian music back to the early 1900s. You know, the whites, when they came here, the missionaries, and taught people Christianity, it was forbidden to dance in church. Mm. If you go to England, it's still like that. They say it's a sin. But, um, but when they, so the Ghanaians politely didn't dance in their churches, but as soon as Ghanaians became independent, they started dancing because that's a natural way for an Af African, not just Ghanaian, to worship God. In the olden days, worshipping their gods, mm -hmm. and now worshipping God. Um, so there, there was a, a sort of a, a liking of dancing in the churches, in the, independent, in, the, in the separatist churches that we have so many of in Ghana. And then, of course, the, the military era, the, the, the destruction of the music industry, which was inadvertent, as I mentioned, but it wasn't planned, but it happened, and the exodus, the brain drain, and all those things, it resulted in a lot of unemployed popular artists. So many, so I just can't even, some of them even, uh, they ran away to Nigeria, you know, they, or Ivory Coast, or further abroad. But those who stayed, what can they do? There's no commercial music industry. You can't get the material to make records. You can't even get guitar strings. And then there was a curfew for two and a half years. So what they did is they went into the churches. And because the Ghanaian churches uh, were, were dancing churches, they embraced them. And there was a, a sort of a fusion between high life and popular music with church music. And that occurred really in the 1970s. Um, I think one of the earliest bands that did this was Joyful Way in Winneba, or was it Cape Coast, I think. Um, but quickly it caught on. So you, 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 you could say that was a huge pool of unemployed or underemployed musicians, dance band and guitar band musicians, who were dr drafted into the churches and they could get, you know, sustenance. And it changed the music, and it's, uh, it was dance music. So I was running my recording studio here in the 80s, Boko Recording Studio, and I noticed that, you know, so, uh, the bands that were the gospel bands were playing exactly the same music, the same rhythms as the gu guitar bands, say, or the mm. dance bands. The only difference was that the lyrics were for God instead of for love, or women, or adore, or whatever. Um, and then, of course, as you were mentioning, it opened up a space for women, mm -hmm. because as mentioned earlier, you know, if you get women going on stage in the olden days would be considered to be prostitutes. And it was very difficult for women to play popular music, even up to about the 1970s. But once you have the church as an avenue, how can you stop your wife or your daughter, um, you know, playing in a church? Even though they're still playing dance music, but it's sacred dance music. So, uh, so that, that's how the church really helped um, the Ghanaian music industry. In fact, roughly between anywhere between 50 and 60 percent of the total commercial output of music made in this country is gospel music. Wow. It's not dancehall, it's not hip life, it's not reggae, it's not secular high life. But it's dominated by, uh, by people don't really ha realize how big the gospel sector is. Um, and also the other thing, and here's a very interesting thing, mm -hmm. is while the youth were turning to gadgets and miming. You know, they were using drum machines and sometimes they couldn't even play on stage. They would just mime. I think you've been to those types mm -hmm. of shows. The church couldn't do miming. You know, if you want to raise the Holy Ghost in church, you've got to have live music. If you use somebody miming 
or with electronic gadgets, where's the Holy Ghost in this? So they maintained what we call live performance. And the youth in Ghana, they're coming out of it now, but for about 15, 20 years, they had gravitated into miming and lip syncing with gadgets. You don't even see a band. You just see somebody miming. Okay, so the, the youth l lost their taste for live music. Um, but the church never lost it because you can't get the Holy Ghost unless you with have live music. Yes, with lip syncing. So they, they, they also, and, and the last thing is, even at the music department where I teach, because music had been taken out of the education system with the SSS reorganization, most of our, mu uh, our students who can play a Western instrument at all have been trained in the churches. So they've actually, the church has acted as a very positive, um, in a positive way for the Ghanaian music industry. And we're now beginning to see some of the great singers coming out of the church and moving into secular music, like uh, Wiala, for instance, was yes. church trained. Or Kwame Eugen, church yes, trained. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, if you look at all the great singers and har harmonizers, because rapping, you know, hip, hip life is not singing, it's, it's chanting or rapping. Mm -hmm. They don't use full harmonies, but well, those who can really hold a melody and harmonize are coming out of the churches. And, and this is exactly what happened in America back in the 50s when James Brown and Aretha Franklin and all the others came out of the black churches and created soul music. They took the, the uh, techniques they'd learnt or the inspiration, that's why they call it soul music. I mean, it, it, when you say soul music, you don't consider it to be religious music. It's not the music of the black church, but they retain that connection beca because that's where they were all trained. So they called it soul. Uh, you know, the soul of black folk, maybe, or something. So like the things like Ray Charles used to do. Exactly. All of those guys were trained in churches. So we've now got a huge uh, group of people who have been trained as to play instruments and can sing inside the churches. And some of them will come into the secular field and enrich it. And, so, and they're already doing this, in fact. And so finally, with all this, you look at, we're in 2019. What do you make of Ghanaian music? Well, at the moment, if you read the book, you notice I've, I've divided what's going on musically in Ghana into 17 pots. I imagine you've got a big stove. Some people think I can predict the future, but I can't. I mean, all I can say, the state of the Ghanaian music industry is we've got a musical stove and we've got about 17 pots simmering away. How the thing will develop in the future, I don't know. But the, these pots... But is it good to have 17 pots? Oh, yes, the more the merrier. The okay. more pots you have, the better because that's more creative possibilities. And we still have the traditional pot. You know, traditional music is still with us in Ghana. It's not like Europe or America, where folklore is, a, they call, is dead. You know, we don't have folklore in Ghana. It's the wrong term. We have folk life, because it's still alive. Mm. Um, and I, I'll just say one thing, that right now, the whole of the Western youth has turned to electronic dance music, and they're running out of beats. There's so many soul or funk beats you can, or hip hop, hip hop, they're running out anyway. You know how many beats we have in Africa? Or well, let's say just Ghana alone. We have, what, 30 ethnic groups. Let's take the Dag people of Dagbon. Just the people of Dagbon alone have 60 separate independent ri dance rhythms. Okay? 60. 60. Just, just the people. Now add to the Ashantis, the Eves, the Enzimas, the Gars, you name it. Uh, we probably just in Ghana alone have about a thousand indigenous rhythms that could be developed. Mm. And if you take the whole of Africa, it's probably about 50,000. So in the end, these people abroad are going to wake up to what is here and they're going to grab it. So what I'm suggesting is that the, say the Ghanaians should treasure their traditional rhythms and find some ways of organizing or getting copyright. You were talking about Paul Simon and copyright. Copyright these, but not for Ghanaians. You can't copyright Ghanaians not to use their own rhythms, right? Yeah. But maybe if foreigners use it, Ghana will That's collect some money. Because in the end, the, the Europeans and the Americans or Chinese or whatever, they're going to come to Africa because the, the richest rhythmic resource in the whole planet is sitting in this continent. And Ghana is a component of that. All right, then. Thank you very much, Professor John Collins. It's been an, a fantastic hour spent with you journeying to Ghanaian music. And for those of you at home, if you want to join the you know, journey we've been on, you can simply get a copy of the book. It's called High Life Time 3, written by John Collins. Over 600 pages, but it tells you everything you need to know about where Ghana music came from, what happened to it, where it is going. 
and it, it's not a boring read i can tell you so enter a bookshop around you prof we can get to the university bookshop can't yeah, you? yeah yeah okay so yes all you need to do is go there and get yourself a copy and read it my name is Godfrey Akotobo i have been speaking to professor john collins on Ghanaian music as we celebrate our heritage month have a good day